chapter 17, beginning at verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you, and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring and you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will read responsibly Psalm 23, beginning, 22, beginning at verse 23. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him, and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. For you comes, from you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous, prosperous, prosperous of the earth, eat and worship before him, shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him, and shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. Today's epistle comes from Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, Though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us say together the Lenten verse. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 8th chapter. 
glorious to you, O oh Lord. And I uh, encourage your devout listening, uh, as this will be the basis for our discussion in a few minutes of the sermon time. Verse 27, And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. <clears throat> and he called to him the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and for the Gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? For what can a man give in return for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. With all believers, let us now confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us then and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and descended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated, and together let's sing number 427 in the hymnal, uh, In the Cross of Christ I Glory, and you can also find the words up on the screen. In the Christ, the cross of Christ, I glory.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Heavenly Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Dear God, it's good to be here. It's good to be in the midst of your people, in your holy church, under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, hearing the word. Help us to be hearers and doers of the word. Send us your Holy Spirit through this word as you promised so that we can hear and believe and be faithful followers of the cross. Amen. I want to tell you today about a lady. I think her name was Irene. And this happened maybe 50 or 60 years ago. She lived in a small town. It was back when they had tobacco shops, cigar shops, and oftentimes, some of you might remember this, they used to have big statues of, or wooden statues of Indians out in front. Anybody remember those, seeing those around? Okay. And anyway, um, this lady started out as a washerwoman. She was a lowly person, I guess you'd say, in many people's eyes. But she was very articulate. And she was not ashamed to talk about the Lord. So oftentimes she'd find a way in the middle of a conversation to third turn things around to spiritual matters and talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, one day she was out and about downtown. As she got older, she lost her vision. She couldn't see very well. And she was out in front of this tobacco shop, and she was having a very vigorous conversation with this wooden Indian. People were walking by her, laughing, snickering. Finally, someone came up to her and said, Irene, do you know that you're talking to a wooden Indian? And she didn't miss a beat. She said, well, at least I'm not a wooden Christian who doesn't say anything about the Lord Jesus Christ. At least I'm a living Christian, a real Christian, who talks about him. And today the Lord Jesus Christ wants to talk to us about what it means to be a real Christian, a living Christian, and not a wooden Christian. And it all revolves around today, at least, talking about the cross, Jesus did say, if you want to be one of my disciples, you need to take up your cross and follow me. And I want to talk about three kinds of crosses today. Jesus may be calling us at some time in our life to pick up one of these kinds of crosses. First cross is the cross of misunderstanding and misperception. Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? There's a lot of misperception, a lot of misunderstanding. Um, as Jesus was even conducting his ministry, God in the flesh, talking to people, performing miracles, but people still didn't understand who he was when they were confronted with Jesus face to face. So the disciples told Jesus, some people say that you are John the Baptist. You read through the New Testament, you see that um, that's what Herod Antipas thought. Herod Antipas had beheaded John the Baptist, and now he sees Jesus out and about on the heels of this beheading, performing all of these miracles, teaching in a way that was um, getting right down into people's hearts and souls. And he even saw um, Jesus' disciples performing miracles, so he was convinced that Jesus was really John the Baptist, resurrected from the dead. Not only Herod Antipas, but a lot of other people thought that this is who Jesus was, also according to the text. Some people thought that Jesus was Elijah. 
If you read um, Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, it says there, it talks about Elijah coming and ushering in the Messianic era. So, um, actually, that was the, the um, work of John the Baptist. But people thought that maybe this is who Jesus was. This Elijah talked about in Malachi chapter uh, 4, um, ushering in the time of the Messiah. And then some other people thought that Jesus was one of the prophets. So, a great prophet maybe that had lived before and now he was resurrected. Or maybe just a great teacher and prophet. So Jesus, during his ministry, during his time here on earth, had to lift up that cross, if you might, you might say, of being misunderstood as to who he was and what he came to do. Um, the only one that really seemed to get it right, at least in the text, there were others also, I'm sure, was Peter. And you remember what he said? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So at least he got that right. Um, in the Matthew account, if you go back to Matthew chapter 16, um, Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood has not revealed that to you, but my Father in heaven. And if you go to uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, it says, The man without the Spirit receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him, because they are spiritually discerned. So evidently, the Holy Spirit had worked on Peter's heart, at least, through the miracles of Jesus, through the teaching of Jesus, and he realized, he perceived who Jesus really was. If you today are sitting here in this congregation, and you understand with Peter who Jesus really is, then praise be to God. You should be thanking God every day of your life that the Holy Spirit has come to you and that you're not confused about this most imper uh, person, this most important person, this pivotal person in the history of the world, Jesus Christ. Because if you're confused about him, you will be confused and ashamed eternally. But anyway... Um, there are a lot of people today who are um, confused about Jesus Christ. And just like the people in uh, Jesus' day, they had a lot of good things to say about him. A lot of people have good things to say about Jesus today, don't they? He was a great prophet. He was a great teacher. He was a uh, social liberator and on and on and on. But uh, to have that faith that understands who Jesus really is... That is a true gift from God. Jesus, though, as I started out to say, had to lift up that cross many times of misunderstanding. There were just a lot of people who could not comprehend because of their lack of faith who he really was. And today, we have to sometimes lift up that cross of uh, misperception and misunderstanding. Um, the early Christians, do you know what people called them? They called them cannibals because of the way they um, conducted Holy Communion. They had, I guess you would call maybe a form of closed communion. They would send out the catechumens. They would send out the non-Christians. They would shut the doors, and they would have communion among those who had been catechized and confirmed in the Christian faith. And the pagans outside who didn't know what was going on, they heard that they were drinking someone's blood and they were eating someone's flesh, so they concluded that they were eating the flesh and drinking the blood of babies. So they called Christians cannibals. They were also called by the Roman Empire, people in the Roman Empire, pagans, because they would not worship the panoply of gods uh, of the Roman Empire. And so also today, I think there are a lot of misconceptions about who Christians are. Some people say that we are self-righteous, that we are holier than thou, 
And maybe some of us, or maybe sometimes in our lives, we come across that way. But I think that's kind of a gross generalization to say that all Christians are that way. Sometimes, especially today, we're called haters because we don't condone some of the sins that people condone today in the general society. But you and I know most of our fellow Christians are very humble, gracious people that love and accept everyone and want to draw them into the Church of Jesus Christ and into a relationship with Him. But again, sometimes because of unbelief, those are the misconceptions out there. So as Christians, rather than putting down the cross, rather than being ashamed of Jesus, we need to keep on carrying that cross sometimes of misunderstanding. Jesus also, as he lived here, and especially as he conducted his three and a half year ministry here on earth, he had to pick up the cross of opposition. And it's kind of interesting, we see it here very clearly in the um, gospel lesson. One of Jesus' most vocal supporters, Peter, remember what he had just said, who do people say that I am? And Peter pipes up and he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. His most vocal supporter becomes his greatest opponent. What's going on here? Well, Jesus, as he's walking around the cities of Caesarea Philippi, these are his disciples. These are the 12 who are going to be his apostles. And he needs to raise them up. He needs to prepare them for the work of apostleship. And so he's giving them some very intimate details about who he is and what the gospel is all about. And he's going to have to go through some suffering. In fact... The pagan enemies of the Jewish nation are the ones that are going to facilitate the work and ministry of the Messiah who's come to save the Jewish nation and all nations of the world. And uh, Peter just cannot wrap his head around this, that the Messiah is going to have to go through all of this. It doesn't make any sense seems counterintuitive, it's unthinkable, it's illogical to Peter, but friends, we need to understand this, because we're going out with the same gospel today, and we have to realize the nature of the gospel, the gospel's a scandalous message, the gospel does not make sense to our human reason. And when the gospel is preached in its truth and purity, when it's preached to people who have unbelieving flesh, the unbelieving flesh rises up and rebels against it. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. So as we go out, don't water it down and preach Christ crucified, as a way of salvation to the world, many of unbelievers out there, when they first hear that message, it seems like an illogical, ridiculous message. But that's the way God is. Remember it says in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8, you can look it up, um, giving you my paraphrase, that God's ways are not our ways. Our ways are not God's ways. And God uses some seemingly weak and foolish and miserable means sometimes to save us. And as we understand that through faith, actually, it increases our faith. To see that God's ways are not our ways, and that God uses some very strange and unique and glorious means in order to save the world and to save people. Um, today, when we confess Jesus Christ, when we shine with the gospel, when we witness, um, we're going to be confronted with opposition. And in fact, today we're talking about being a winsome witness 
in a polarized world. And that's the class that Marion is uh, teaching at 915, just a plug for her class. It's a really good class. It's thought-provoking. But in a polarized world, as we bring out the true, genuine gospel of Jesus Christ, if it's done in the right way, it is going to bring some opposition. And that becomes a scary thing to us. But here's maybe some examples of what that opposition might be. Maybe you've experienced that opposition in your life. Maybe you're like I read. Uh, God increased her tribe, by the way. God increased the tribe of those who are not ashamed of the gospel and are willing to stand up and even to talk to wooden Indians about the gospel. No one else will listen. Talk to a wooden Indian about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, but anyway, and as we talk, as we witness, as we live our lives, um, some people around us, maybe even family members, maybe even good friends of ours, relatives, um, neighbors, think that we're crazy, that we're just absolute, we've got a screw loose up there or something like that, believing the stuff that uh, was written so many years ago. Um, sometimes also the opposition might come right where we're working at, right in the middle of our job that we're doing, as we're living righteous and upright lives in a depraved world, standing for justice and peace and love and sincerity and honesty and righteousness. People might see that and say, oh, he's not a candidate for a promotion. <laughs> We might think that we are. We've got all the attributes that are necessary, but because we stand out and stand against some of the practices and some of the um, evil in this world, we might not find ourselves rising up into the higher echelons of the business world or the political world. And you can expect the devil to oppose you. He loves to do that. He's a master at finding Christians and throwing monkey wrenches at them so that they become discouraged and feel like giving up and putting down that cross as they encounter his opposition. And getting back to Peter, he's a follower of Jesus, an outspoken follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, one of the men that Jesus thought he could really rely on. And uh, remember he said about the cross, never, Lord. That should never happen to you. Uh, going to the cross is beneath your dignity. It's not the way we understand the Bible. It's not according to the way we think things should, should happen. And I think the same thing happens today, even in the church. Some people hear true proclamation of law and gospel. They hear the Bible lifted up as the very word of God. It's not allegorized. It's not watered down. And people are thinking, oh my, that's scary stuff that the pastor or this teacher is um, speaking up here. It's going to offend somebody out there. We're going to lose members. We're going to have some visitors come in and they're going to hear this real sharp stuff from the Bible and they're never going to come back again. We're going to drive people away. So we've got to tone it down a little bit, water it down, make it more palatable to uh, the modern ear. Uh, the last time I checked, folks, the historic preaching and teaching of the church has been a strong message, a message that stirs up a reaction in unbelieving hearts. And so um, this guy here is probably not going to be watering things down anytime soon. Um, sometimes as we continue to lift up the cross, even in the midst of opposition, as Jesus did, and misunderstanding, things come to a crescendo. 
And now I want to talk to you lastly about the cross of shame and suffering. We alluded, it, alluded to it before, but Jesus did carry that cross at the end of his ministry, at the apex of his time here on earth. He, he carried that cross of shame and suffering outside of Jerusalem, outside of the city gates to a place called Calvary. And he suffered uh, more shame and loss and humiliation than any person in the history of mankind. And at the climax of his suffering, as it says in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might be found the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. So that's what happened to Jesus on the cross. And as he became sin for us, he even experienced the rejection of his Father in heaven for our sakes. And so Jesus, as we're walking here on this earth, he's asking us, he's telling us, you need to also, if you're going to be my genuine disciple, even take up that cross of shame and suffering. What did he say in the text? If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospel will save it. And what is the point of worship services? What is the point of Sunday school? What is the point of two years of catechism class? Well, if you remember your, catech your vows of confirmation, you stood up in front of the congregation and you said on the day of your confirmation that I will even give up my life for this gospel. That's the point of it all, folks, that if we're called upon by our Lord, he may not call us to do this, but he may, that we will not shun even the cross of shame and suffering for his sake. I was reading the Christian News Northwest the other day. Um, we have copies of it out there in the narthex. And the president of Moody Bible Institute, his name is J. Paul Nyquist, He's written a book. It's called Living Your Faith in an Increasingly Hostile Culture. Um, and this is just a few things that he had to say. Two quotes from him. First of all, the American church has missed a vital element of discipleship. Important spiritual formation cannot be realized without experiencing suffering. And also, he says, persecution supplies life-shaping tools God skillfully uses to mold us into Christ's image. And it's only through suffering and carrying that cross of suffering and shame that we ultimately receive the crown. Jesus went through that suffering and shame. And then he rose again on Easter Sunday, and he ascended into heaven. And now, right now, as we're speaking, Jesus is surrounded by myriads of angels who are worshiping him. He's surrounded by saints and martyrs, and many of our relatives who have gone on before us who knew Jesus Christ. He definitely has the crown of glory right now. But he had to go through shame and loss before he got the crown. Uh, not, this is not the message of popular churches today. In a lot of popular churches today, you won't find a cross. You won't hear a lot of preaching on the cross. You won't hear a lot of law and gospel you won't hear a lot of preaching regarding repentance, but you do hear a lot about having a happy and fulfilling life. Name it, 
it and claim it. In other words, as a Christian, you deserve, this is their preaching, not mine, you deserve to be happy and fulfilled and healthy and rich. And so all you have to do is demand it from God. And by the way, if you don't get it, then there's something wrong with your faith. And so that's why a lot of people are driven out of the church through this name it and claim it theology of glory because they find it really does not work and they think that's the Christian message. And if that's the Christian message, they don't want to have anything to do with it. Jesus was confronted by that same theology of glory out in the desert last week. The devil was coming to him and trying to say to him, there's a way around suffering, there's a way around the cross, just follow me. Jesus rejected it, and he's calling us to reject that also today, and to take up the historic message of the church, and the historic way of discipleship, which is that old rugged cross. Now, he's not asking us, most likely, to be beheaded by ISIS today, or to be kidnapped by Boko Haram, <coughs> but... He is asking us to take up our cross, and every cross is shaped differently. You have a cross that's shaped exactly for you, that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ and from our God from eternity. And if you take up that cross joyfully and obediently in the power of the Holy Spirit, you will glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and help his kingdom come. Don't be seduced by the lie that being a disciple of Jesus Christ should be some sort of easy ride into heaven. All the saints have been called to suffer in some way for the gospel. And after we carry our crosses for a time, we will receive that crown. You can be sure of it. And if you're suffering a cross right now, if you're suffering opposition, if people don't understand who you are, if you feel shame and humiliation, I just want to you to remember this one thing, and then we'll close. It says in the book of Isaiah, No weapon that is fashioned against you shall succeed, and you shall confute every tongue that rises against you. So as we remember that, <laughs> and we take up our cross, we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. He has won the battle. We just need to follow in his footstep with our cross held high. Amen. And the peace of God that passes all understanding. Keep our hearts and our minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.